Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. Tom Wheeler, the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, is expected to unveil his decision on the crucial issue of net neutrality within the next few weeks. The decision is fraught with controversy after Wheeler proposed a two-tier system last year that would create an unequal playing field on the Internet, provoking outrage from consumers and corporations. Today's media is dominated by online consumption. We turn to the internet for our print news, to watch talk shows, to enjoy television and film, post photos, tweet our opinions, and in general communicate with one another. But our online media landscape, like traditional media, is increasingly dominated by large corporate entities that have often banked on notions of internet freedom in order to be free to profit. Well, how did things get the way they are today? It turns out we have to dig quite deep within our history all the way to the 1940s to determine political decisions and turning points that led to our present day system and to make the case that it is not a natural or predetermined outcome. My guest is Victor Picard, assistant professor at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. He's the author of the new book, America's Battle for Media Democracy, The Triumph of Corporate Libertarianism and the Future of Media Reform. Welcome to Uprising, Victor. Thank you, Sonali. Good to be here. Well, where was American media in the 1940s? Obviously, most of us weren't, or many of us weren't around at that time. What was the dominant medium of choice? So the dominant medium at that time in the 1940s was commercial radio. And at this time, you had um, basically the majority of the radio landscape dominated by two major companies, NBC and CBS. And you also had an FCC at this time that was trying to decide how to best regulate this still relatively new medium, how to decide what is the role of media in a democratic society. And there were a lot of debates that are somewhat familiar to us today that were taking place in the 40s. So would you say that radio, in a way, was as revolutionizing to people's uh, ability to communicate and to hear the news as Internet is today? Absolutely. You heard a lot of the same kind of rhetoric that you hear today about the potential for this new medium to revolutionize society, to democratize society, to give voice to the voiceless. Um, things that we're very familiar with today that we often hear about with regards to the Internet. Right. And we should say, actually, that Pacifica Radio, where this network, uh, where this radio station that we're broadcasting from was born, uh, came out of that same radio revolution and out of the kind of discomfort that people started to feel that I want to turn to uh, in a minute around the corporatization of radio. How, how crucial, actually, let's step back first, how crucial was this notion that the that the airwaves that the frequencies that radio stations uh, broadcast on still broadcast on in terms of traditional radio that those belong to the public and that private entities had to lease them from the public to borrow them in order to communicate to us that is an important concept but we take it for granted you're absolutely right today we hear that sometimes it might sound like a, a slogan that came out of the out of the 60s but it's very much true and even back in the 1940s this, this was a kind of rallying cry for various media reform groups who kept reminding everyone that the air belongs to the people. And this is something that, when you think about it, that these private companies are able to lease uh, essentially for free and then make tremendous amounts of profit from these public airwaves. Um, it's a core contradiction, and it helped motivate a very vibrant media reform movement in the 1940s. 